Hello, and welcome to Conversations from the World of Allergy, a podcast produced by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I'm your host, Dave Stukas. I'm a board-certified allergist and immunologist and serve as the social media medical editor for the Academy. Our podcast series will use different formats to interview thought leaders in the world of allergy and immunology. This podcast is not intended to provide any individual medical advice to our listeners. We do hope that our conversations provide evidence-based information. Any questions pertaining to one's own health should always be discussed with their personal physician. The Find an Allergist search engine on the Academy website is a useful tool to locate a listing of board-certified allergists in your area. Finally, use of this audio program is subject to the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Terms of Use Agreement, which you can find at www.aaai.org. Today's edition of our Conversations from the World of Allergy podcast series will be meaningful for both healthcare professionals and really anyone who's interested in or living with food allergies. Today's guest is Dr. Jacob Catan. Dr. Catan is an assistant professor of pediatrics in the Jack and Lucy Clark Department of Pediatrics at the Icon School of Medicine and the Mount Sinai Kravis Children's Hospital in New York City. Dr. Catan is a clinician researcher with a focus on improving the diagnosis and management of pediatric food allergy. Lastly, Dr. Catan is the perfect guest for today's episode, as he is now the chair of the newly formed Food Allergen Advisory Labeling Workgroup within the Adverse Reactions to Foods Committee of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. That's a mouthful. But with that, Dr. Catan, thank you so much for taking the time to join us, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It's, it's really a pleasure to talk about this important topic. I agree. I think we're gonna we're gonna learn a lot, and it's very nuanced, which is this. I think this is the perfect format to allow experts such as yourself to really dive into some of that. But before we get into some of the the discussions surrounding precautionary labeling, I'd like to begin just by having you describe IgE mediated food allergies. Uh, I think that'll help set the stage and give some background. Can you offer you know some information regarding the prevalence, most common allergens, and how these typically present? So. When we talk about a food allergy and an IgE-mediated food allergy, we're talking about an adverse immune response to a food. Um, you know, it's basically when the immune system, which is used to fighting things like infections, such as bacteria, viruses, gets misdirected and decides to fight a protein in our food. And that can lead to severe reactions that can involve a wide range of symptoms that could include hives, swelling, abdominal pain, vomiting even life-threatening symptoms like trouble breathing or a drop in blood pressure after somebody ingests a food allergen. Those symptoms usually start very shortly after ingesting a food, often within minutes of the ingestion, um, and almost always within two hours of ingesting a food. A food allergy is very different from when we talk about an intolerance to a food, which is not an immune system response. One example of a intolerance of a food would be a lactose intolerance, where an enzyme deficiency results in gastrointestinal symptoms after ingestion of milk or dairy. And that could lead to symptoms such as gassiness, bloating, or even loose stools. In regards to the prevalence of food allergy, there was a study uh, in 2018 by Ruchi Gupta and her colleagues um, that surveyed over 50,000 households in the U.S and estimated that about 1 in 10 adults and about 1 in 12 children suffer from a food allergy. There are nine foods that cause most food allergic reactions, probably about 90% of food allergic reactions, and those allergens include milk, wheat, peanut, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, wheat, soy, and sesame. Okay, so it sounds like what you're describing is with food allergy, it's reproducible whenever people eat the food, and you describe some of the symptoms and some most common foods. And over the last few years, it, I've been reading more and more about sort of this individual variation regarding food allergies. What have we learned in regards to, you know, does every person with food allergy react to the same amount of the allergen or with the same symptoms, or does, does everybody sort of have their own personal story in regards to their allergy? Yeah, that's a great question, and and you know our, our jobs would be a lot simpler <laughs> if you know people reacted to the same amount of an allergen or or the same amount each time in an individual person or even with the same symptoms. But but no, unfortunately, food allergies can be highly variable from person to person, um, or even from reaction to reaction within an individual. 
Some people with a food allergy may have a mild reaction after eating a full serving of a food, while others can have severe reactions to very small amounts of an allergen. And I think this is where terms such as eliciting dose, or some people call it threshold dose or reactive dose or things like that come into play. So what, what is an eliciting dose and what do terms such as ED1 or ED50 mean? An eliciting dose is the amount of an allergen ingested that brings on an allergic reaction for an individual. So for example, the term ED1 would refer to the eliciting dose, the amount of the allergen that would bring on a reaction in 1% of people with an allergy to that particular allergen, while the ED50 would refer to the amount of the allergen, the dose that would cause a reaction in half of the people allergic to that particular allergen. And when we talk about this, is this something that we're just guessing or is this, you know, been extrapolated from actual food challenges and research and on, on a wide variety of people who have specific food allergies? It's something that we're, we're starting to get more data on, you know, but the, the problem is that the, the ED1, the ED5, the ED50 um, can be dependent on the way that a study is done. So, mm -hmm. For example, you know, the eliciting dose for you know, a certain group of patients may depend on the age of those patients. It may depend on the type of patient that's being brought in. Is somebody bringing in patients who are known to be highly allergic to a food or are they bringing in the general population? Um, it might even depend on things like how long somebody waits in between the doses. So when some studies have looked at eliciting, eliciting doses, they do food challenges in slow increasing amounts over time. So for example, in a food like peanut, you might start by giving one one hundredth of a peanut and waiting to see if somebody reacts. And if they don't, you might move on to a thirtieth of a peanut. And if they don't react, a tenth of a peanut and so on, waiting to see when a reaction begins. The problem with that is, you know, even the time that you wait in between giving those doses might depend on when you see the reaction. So, for example, if you wait 15 minutes in between doses, but somebody wasn't going to react to a particular dose for 30 minutes, mm -hmm. it might look like they reacted to the next dose. They might have a higher eliciting dose than they actually have if you had waited an hour in between doses or two hours in between doses. Obviously, for practical reasons, it would be very hard to wait that long when you're doing a food challenge in between doses. Um, sometimes the eliciting dose can even depend on the doses you're deciding to give. So, for example, if one study starts by giving people 100 milligrams of peanut and then jumps to 300 and then jumps to 1,000 milligrams of peanut, they might see a reaction at 1,000 milligrams of peanut in a particular patient. If another group decides to perform eliciting dose challenges going from 100 milligrams to 300 milligrams to 500 milligrams before they jump to 1,000, they might see an eliciting dose at that 500 milligram dose, whereas the previous study wouldn't have seen it until 1,000 milligrams because they skipped over that 500 milligram dose. So it can be very difficult to you know, put out a widespread I guess, guidance as to what the eliciting doses are for a particular patient um, when there are so many factors that can, you know, affect the, the eliciting dose. And to help orient our audience and our listeners, approximately how many milligrams of protein are in, say, one peanut kernel? So one peanut kernel contains about 300 milligrams of peanut protein. Okay. And based upon the available literature and evidence, uh, what do we know about the, say, eliciting dose for 50% of the people with peanut allergy? How much do they need to eat to cause any reaction at all? So I'm going to start answering that question by saying that there's a great figure in a recent paper published by Scott Sisher and his colleagues in JACI in practice titled Managing Food Allergy When the Patient is Not Highly Allergic. Um, and in that paper, there's a figure that actually has 
pictures of food allergens, whether it's egg or peanut or milk, and it shows the amounts of the foods measured at the approximate ED50 for those foods. Um, so, for example, the estimated eliciting dose that causes 50% of people with a peanut allergy to react is somewhere between 165 and 236 milligrams of peanut protein. At about 200 milligrams of peanut protein, that equates to about two-thirds of one whole peanut. Um, and in that paper, there's a picture of two-thirds of one whole peanut. Um, for milk, that ED50 has been reported to be about 166 milligrams of milk protein, and that equates to about one teaspoon of milk. For a food like sesame, it's about 300 milligrams of sesame protein, which is the equivalent of about 600 sesame seeds. So for some of these common food allergens, if you're asking what's the eliciting dose that will make 50% of people with those allergies react, for peanut, it's about two-thirds of a peanut. For milk, it's about a teaspoon of milk. And for sesame, it's a whopping 600 sesame seeds. I, I love that you referenced that paper. The, the title alone, I am, I love. Uh, I think it's great because it really highlights our our current understanding of the individualized nature of food allergy, as sort of you already alluded to early in our conversation. So, you, okay, so half the people would need to eat roughly two thirds of one peanut to have any reaction at all, where half the people would actually need to eat less than that. How can we determine each person's individual eliciting dose? Are there easy and available, you know, tests that we can just order? That would be wonderful, but, but unfortunately, <laughs> no. Um, there are no easy ways to determine a person's individual eliciting dose. You know, the most reliable way to determine um, an eliciting dose is to do a food challenge, um, feeding slowly increasing amounts of an allergen until someone starts to have an allergic reaction. Um, but as I mentioned before, even that can be somewhat unreliable. You know, the threshold that can cause a reaction may be affected by the form of the av uh, food allergen used in the challenge. The doses used, again, how big the jumps are between the doses, the interval of time used between the doses, or even how a reaction is defined by the person performing the food challenge. We also know from recent studies that an individual's threshold can actually change based on outside factors. Uh, for example, if a person who's allergic to a food exercises right after eating that food, their threshold might be lower. If they have a lack of sleep, their threshold might decline. If they're sick at the time, if they have a fever, or even taking medications, uh, NSAIDs like ibuprofen, can change somebody's eliciting dose from day to day. And and that's really fascinating information is because a lot of families tell me that they were taught, I think this is commonly taught, that food allergy reactions get worse every time. So the first time if you have hives, the next time it could, you know, send to the hospital and cause airway swelling and things like that. Is this actually true or is there more to the story? This is something that, that I think all allergists hear pretty often, you know. Is my child going to have a more severe reaction the next time? Is it going to be life-threatening? I've heard that it gets worse every time. And, you know, that's, that's really a, a misconception. It's not true that allergic reactions will get worse each time they occur. You know, reaction severity is highly variable. Someone who has had a previous mild reaction may have a, a severe reaction with a subsequent ingestion. But someone else who had a severe reaction in the past might have a mild reaction upon their next exposure to an allergen. You know, again, the severity of a reaction may be affected by the amount of an allergen ingested, the form of the food or how it is prepared. For example, if you're allergic to dairy, baked milk might be less allergenic or cause less of a reaction than, than raw milk. Uh, and that's similar to egg, where baked egg is less allergenic than, than cooked egg, like a scrambled egg. The severity of a reaction might be influenced by whether or not someone has asthma and whether or not that asthma is well controlled. If the asthma is not well controlled, that person might be predisposed to having more severe allergic reaction. Even something like how quickly someone uses their emergency medications when they're having an allergic reaction might affect the way that the reaction progresses. If you use that EpiPen 
or, or auto in, epinephrine auto injector early in an allergic reaction, that might prevent the reaction from getting worse, from progressing to a more severe symptom. Part of the the question about do do allergy symptoms or allergic reactions get worse from one reaction to the next may be somewhat influenced by recent evidence that infants are more likely to have isolated skin, skin symptoms during an allergic reaction to a food and be less likely to have respiratory or cardiovascular symptoms compared to older children or adults. So there is some truth to the statement that someone may be more likely to have a severe allergic reaction when they are older compared to a reaction they had with their first exposure to an allergen as an infant. But in general, food allergic reactions do not necessarily get worse with each exposure. I, I really appreciate that eloquent sort of discussion you offered surrounding that because that's a common misconception I think all of us hear and for our listeners you know we just heard Dr. Catan give us you know <laughs> a very nuanced um, sort of uh, discussion surrounding that topic and I hope that that resonates with folks. Along the lines of some interesting and scary stories that circulate online regarding food allergy reactions a lot of these are, you know, are Reported to occur from casual exposure to allergens and not actually eating it. Can you give us some perspective regarding actual risk for any reaction, let alone anaphylaxis or severe life threatening reactions, if someone just touches a surface where a food allergen was present previously or if they're just sitting next to somebody eating their allergen? That's another great, uh, great question with a lot of, I think, misconceptions uh, in the public. You know, it is very unlikely that touching a surface where an allergen is present or sitting near someone eating an allergen is going to cause a systemic allergic reaction. You know, touching an allergen can certainly lead to a rash or hives where the allergen contacts the skin. But without an ingestion, more severe symptoms are very unlikely. I think that it's important to keep in mind with very young children that if they get an allergen on their hand, they might put their hand in their mouth or if they're sitting near someone eating an allergen, that they might grab that allergen and, and put it in their mouth. But it's still the ingestion that causes the systemic symptoms. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's not being in close proximity to the allergen. You know, odors don't carry proteins. So even if you smell an allergen, it might cause anxiety. You know, people are trained to recognize peanut or, or other foods that have a strong smell and know that they're supposed to avoid it. But just smelling the allergen or being near it should not cause an allergic reaction. Okay, uh, you've done a great job establishing the importance of this concept surrounding eliciting doses, uh, as well as the importance of really focusing on avoidance measures that, to prevent accidental ingestion. So what are some tips for people to follow to make sure they don't actually eat what they're allergic to by accident? I think the most important way for people to make sure they don't eat what they're allergic to is to carefully read food labels to make sure that an avoided food is not contained in a particular food that they're looking to ingest. Now, manufacturers can always alter their recipes, so even when a product is familiar to a person, they should still look at the ingredient list every time they buy that product. You know, I remember once I saw a patient who was allergic to cow's milk, to dairy. And he had an allergic reaction to a hot dog that contained milk as an ingredient. Now, the dad felt terrible because he always bought the same brand of hot dog for his son. Uh, but one day, he bought the reduced fat hot dogs from the same company instead of the regular ones. And he didn't look at the ingredient list because he had bought hot dogs from this company, you know, a million times before. Mm -hmm. But it turned out that the reduced fat hot dogs did have milk in as an ingredient, while the regular hot dogs did not. Um, and I think it's also important to always mention food allergies to a waiter or to a chef when eating out, even if ordering a dish that is unlikely to contain an avoided food allergen as an ingredient. You know, I always tell patients if they're allergic to a nut, even if they're ordering a macaroni and cheese or a grilled cheese sandwich, still tell the, the waiter, you know, about that food allergen. You never know when a restaurant may decide to spice things up with an unexpected flavor or what else might be cooking on the grill or with the same utensils they are using to prepare your food. So there's no harm in telling the, the, the wait staff, you know, about your food allergy and making sure that the people cooking the food and the chef 
know about your food allergies. Mm, that's great advice. And thankfully, more and more restaurants are becoming food allergy aware. Uh, so that communication is is critical to, you know, dining out safely and frankly, just to enjoy the experience, right? Absolutely. No, I think this is a perfect segue into a discussion on food labels, which is kind of the main topic of our, our conversation here. But you've really set the stage nicely. Can you tell us about the Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act of 2004 and what that means for food labels within the United States? Yeah, so, so this act was really a, a great step for people with, with food allergy. You know, this law required that the eight major allergens at the time, wheat, milk, egg, peanut, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, and soy, not yet sesame, and I'm sure we'll get to that, um, would have to be disclosed in plain English terms in some form on the label, such as the ingredient list, or in a separate clear statement such as contains milk or contains egg. You could no longer, for example, hide an ingredient listing casein as an ingredient as a substitute for milk. This law did not address advisory labeling, such as products that say may contain or processed in a facility with an allergen. That type of labeling is still voluntary. It is not required as opposed to when a major allergen is an intended ingredient in a food. And can you tell us the difference between anything that appears on the front of a package versus, say, the back of a package? Should should people be reading uh, one or the other? Can we trust the you know them both equally, or is there more to that story as well? Yeah, that's another great question, and and I think people might be surprised to hear the answer. Um, you know, the the label that's most important to read is the label on the back of a package, um, where the ingredients are labeled, or there might be a a statement such as contains allergens. The front of the package really isn't regulated. So, for example, the front of a package might say gluten-free, but then you turn to the back of the package and it turns out that there's wheat as an ingredient in that product. Or a product can say that it's vegan on the front, and lo and behold, you look on the back and there is dairy or cow's milk as an ingredient. Um, so, really, it's important for our patients with food allergies to always read the back label um, much more important than looking at what's on the front label of a package. Okay. And as you described, for the last 20 years, almost 20 years, uh, it's been mandated in the United States, any food containing one of the top eight food allergens must clearly state that in some manner. But how much allergen actually needs to be present in a food in order for the manufacturer to be mandated to include a contains label or, or, or things like that? It's an interesting question. I don't think that there is a minimum amount of an allergen that needs to be present in a food for it to be included in a contains label. I think that the manufacturers have to include an allergen if it is an intentional ingredient in any amount. Mm. Um, so the manufacturer is supposed to list it clearly in the ingredients or on a contained statement um, if they know that, that an allergen is an intended ingredient at all in a particular product. Well, I guess on the flip side, is it possible that some foods that have the contains an allergen um, label doesn't actually contain any of that food allergen? So manufacturers really shouldn't state contains an allergen if a product doesn't contain any of that food allergen. You know, one of the guidelines that manufacturers are supposed to follow is that the labeling is not misleading to consumers. Now, that's a very vague statement, but that being said, um, they shouldn't put that a product contains an allergen if it is not an ingredient in that food. Um, that being said, you know, I think we've all heard in the news or, or anecdotally that since sesame was added to the list of major allergens recently, that must be clearly labeled in an ingredient list or a contained statement, some major manufacturers in this country have begun adding sesame to their list of ingredients in products such as bread. And a lot of these products didn't contain sesame as a listed ingredient in the past. Mm 
Now, it's certainly possible that they started adding sesame as an ingredient, or it was such a low ingredient that maybe they didn't include it um, in their list of ingredients before. But this is something that I believe some people in our field, some of my colleagues, are looking into. Uh, they're actually testing some of these products to see where, you know, when sesame is the last ingredient in a product that maybe didn't have it in the past, you know, is sesame truly an ingredient in those products? Um, but hopefully, you know, manufacturers are not misleading the public and only including contains allergen statements if there's actually an allergen contained in that food. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, so the, the sesame topic is a very important one. And for our listeners, we had an episode, oh my gosh, early in um, 2023 with Scott Fisher discussing that specific topic. But can you tell us a little bit more about the 2021 FASTER Act? and how that applies to food labels? I actually really enjoyed that podcast. <laughs> that, was, that was a good one. So if people haven't heard that one and they're interested about sesame allergy, they should definitely check it out. Um, you know, one of the most important aspects of the FASTER Act uh, is that it added sesame to the list of the eight and, and now making it nine major allergens that need to be clearly identified on food labels. Uh, in addition to the addition of, of clear sesame labeling, the FASTER Act mandated that the Secretary of Health and Human Services report to Congress on the prevalence, severity, diagnosis, prevention, treatment, and management of food allergies. You know, ultimately, the goals of the Act were to protect those with sesame allergy, to simplify the process for labeling new allergens as they emerge, and to expand the research needed to find new treatments for food allergies. Great. And so from what you've discussed so far, it sounds like we really should be counseling patients to read the back of the labels on foods uh, every time uh, to avoid anything that clearly states it contains their allergen. What other advice can you offer surrounding reading, reading the ingredient lists or for those uh, who are allergic to foods other than the nine most common causes of allergy? Yeah, I think it's important to keep in mind that other allergens still don't need to be as clearly labeled as the top nine allergens. So, for example, uh, products that contain ingredients that are not considered one of the, the top allergens, such as mustard or, or sunflower seed, um, could be also listed under vague terms in the ingredients, such as spices or natural flavors. Um, so, you know, I think in general... You know, it could be very difficult if you have food allergies to less common food allergens and you're, you're looking at these products and they include things like natural flavors or spices. Uh, and it could also be very difficult for allergists to advise their patients on what to do about those products. You know, obviously patients can call companies and, and try to ask, you know, what do you mean by spices or what's included in natural flavors? Um, but often it could be difficult to get someone to actually answer that question or, or to reach the right people. Um, so, you know, obviously our patients with less common allergies, you know, the best they can do is, is read the ingredient lists and, um, you know, decide what's best for their child. And, and you know, hopefully um, if they do contact a company um, about a product they're interested in giving their child, they can hopefully, you know, get a reliable answer from that company. Yeah, and, and I'm sure you have these conversations. I know I do all the time. This goes back to just what we have discussed so far, of this truly individualized approach to food allergy management, trying to avoid blanket statements and really talking with each patient and family about risk and uh, you know those nuanced topics, I think, can go a long way to hopefully expanding the diet as much as possible. Let's go back to what you touched upon a few minutes ago. Just remind us and or summarize, what are precautionary labels and how do these differ from the mandatory wording of contains? That's probably the most important question, um, you know, related to, to labeling these days. Um, so precautionary, precautionary labeling communicates a potential risk of an unintended allergen uh, being in a particular food while the mandatory contains label refers to when an allergen is present as an intentional ingredient. An unintended allergen may be present in a food, in an otherwise safe food, if exposed to an allergen during, man during manufacturing or processing of the food. Now, advisory labeling in the U U.S. And, and in Canada is largely unregulated. 
Uh, the FDA does say that precautionary, precautionary allergen labeling should be truthful, it should not be misleading, but this leaves many decisions up to manufacturers regarding the use of these labels. Manufacturers might use these labels whenever an allergen is present in a facility, or they may put the label on if they feel that an ineffective cleaning of surfaces or machines could result in cross-contact in a particular food. But precautionary labels also come in many different forms, such as may contain or use shared equipment, and the wording of the label is entirely up to the manufacturer who chooses to include the advisory. It's interesting to me how the wording significantly impacts the perception when I talk to families and patients about this. Um, and, you know, I gave a presentation on this topic a few years ago. Prior to, I went to a local convenience store and I found 18 different examples of these precautionary labels to include. And most of them are on candies and, you know, highly processed foods and things like that. And I, I bought them and I brought them in the presentation. I handed them out. So is there any difference at all between something that states may contain versus process in a facility or something that has, you know, shared equipment? Or do, is there anything that we can discern between these different words? Yeah, it's a, a difficult question to answer. And, and I think 18 different precautionary labels may actually be an underestimate. You know, I think <laughs> we did a study at Mount Sinai back in 2009 that actually found 25 different types Oof. of precautionary allergen labeling on products found at the supermarket. Um, you know, a 2006 survey of U.S. and Canadian consumers showed about half of consumers believed advisory labeling was required by law, which is not, and 37% believed that the type of advisory labeling was based on the amount of allergen present. But that's unfortunately not the case. You know, multiple studies evaluating the unintended presence of allergens in foods showed that the perceived risk did not match the actual risk. So studies have not shown significantly different amounts of allergen contamination in products with one type of advisory wording versus another. The label itself does not indicate how or even if a manufacturer has assessed for contamination with an allergen prior to putting an advisory label on a product. So if a product was, for example, made on equipment that also used a particular allergen earlier in the day, the manufacturer could choose to include a, an advisory statement such as use shared equipment, um, or they may just put a processed and facility advisory label, and that's only if they choose to put any warning label at all. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but what it comes down to is that you know, people shouldn't say, oh, I'm going to eat the may contain products, but not the processed in a facility products because the may contains have more or less risk than, than another label. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I often point out to, to folks, um, would you eat something if it said may not contain? Uh, and more often than not, they say, sure, I would. And I said, well, because that's the exact same meaning as if it says may contain. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a valid. It always comes down to how you word things and and yeah. important point to, to bring up. Well, so you mentioned that, you know, there are actually research studies that have gone through and, and tried to find, you know, allergen in these foods with the different labels on them. And you said there's there's no differences between the labels. But what do we know about is, is there actually allergen present in these foods with precautionary labels? And if so, is it enough to elicit a reaction as we talked about eliciting doses before? Yeah, so, so is this a three-hour podcast? Because I, I think I could go on for a few hours addressing this one. Uh, but I'll, I'll try to keep it brief enough so that, that the listeners don't, don't turn us off. Um, th there are several studies that have shown that allergens can be present in products with precautionary allergen labeling. Uh, most of the studies have looked for the presence of uh, three specific allergens, um, those being peanut, milk, and egg when there are advisory labeling. Um, studies looking at peanut have found the presence of peanut in anywhere from about 45 to 8.5% to of products containing advisory labeling for peanut. The rates of, of peanut contamination were higher in certain products, such as chocolate products, nutritional meal bars, or granola bars. Uh, rates of milk contamination uh, in products with advisory labeling were even higher, ranging from 10.2% to as many as 42% of the products that, that were looked at in different studies. Uh, 
One study showed a particularly high likelihood that milk would be present in dark chocolate products with advisory labeling for milk, with 77.8% containing detectable milk. Um, limited studies on egg have shown very low levels of egg in very few products with advisory labeling, so less risk when egg was included in, in advisory labeling. Um, some studies have also compared the risk of contamination in small versus large manufacturers, and they've demonstrated that smaller companies more li were more likely to have undeclared allergens when there was an uh, advisory label compared to larger companies. You know, whether or not there's enough of the allergen present to an elicit an, allerg an allergic reaction is a tough question to answer. You know, highly allergic patients have been described as a patient who might have a severe reaction to a low-dose exposure to an allergen. You know, and some systemic reviews have shown that most people with food allergy are not highly allergic, as they would not have a severe reaction to a low dose of an allergen, such as those contained in products with advisory labeling. One study looked at the risk of anaphylaxis to peanut and milk and found that less than 5% of study participants reacted at a 5 milligram dose, and only about 5% of the 5% who reacted, reacted with an anaphylactic reaction. Hmm. So it can be difficult, however, to identify that small subset of patients who are highly allergic, um, as there are no specific biomarkers that clinicians can use for that purpose. Wow, this is a, a very nuanced and challenging conversation. So, you know, in on you, if you flip it, I could also interpret what you said as saying more than 90% of products with precautionary labels do not contain any detectable peanut protein. Um, I guess it, it, it all depends on how you look at it, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I actually heard you make a statement like this in a talk a, a couple of years back. And, and it's all about how you focus on the risk. You know, if you want to focus mm -hmm. on risk, sure, tell the patients that there's about a 10% chance that a product with an advisory label will have a detectable amount of an allergen and that there's a 5% chance that their child will have, be allergic enough to react to that amount of the allergen. But, you know, as you're bringing up, you can flip it and focus on how small that risk is. You could tell them there's a 90% chance no allergen will be present, and even if it was present, there's still a 95% chance that it won't be enough to cause a reaction for them or for their child. Um, so, you know, it's, it's certainly one of these times where shared decision-making in medicine comes into play and, and certainly, you know, how much risk somebody is willing to take. If somebody wants no risk, you know, in eating a particular product or is, is highly anxious about their allergy, um, you know, I might be more inclined to, to focus on the risk um, versus if someone is willing to accept a very small amount of risk um, related to their food allergy for the benefits of eating a particular product, we might focus more on that, you know, small chance of, of an allergic reaction. Uh, here's a loaded question, and you do not have to answer this, but uh, I think this is, we're, we're down this rabbit hole. So, all right, do you believe that in at this time, given all that we understand in regards to food allergy and risk, these precautionary labels and things like that, would it be incorrect for all of us to tell every single patient with a food allergy that they absolutely have to avoid foods with precautionary labels on them? I actually do think that would be incorrect. It would make life easy. It would certainly eliminate, you know, a five-minute conversation in clinic and make it a 10-second conversation telling them to avoid things. But you know, I do think that that can be very difficult for patients. It could lead to nutritional consequences, anxiety, um, and can be very limiting because these advisory labels are on so many packages. You know, I think we need to take an individualized approach to the risks surrounding eating foods with advisory labels. You know, factors that I take into account when counseling a patient on avoiding these foods, you know, is whether or not they have a history of a severe reaction to a trace amount of an allergen. You know, the age of a patient comes into play. You know, a, a one-and-a-half-year-old toddler who's going to cry, you know, hysterically five minutes after eating something, you know, because they want to be picked up or they have a wet diaper. You know, I'm going to be less inclined to have the parents give products with advisory labeling because if they gave a product that said, 
may contain milk, and now their child is crying five minutes later, they're going to go into a panic. So the mm-hmm. age of the patient comes into a play. You know, which food is being avoided? Um, so, for example, as I mentioned, I'd be more inclined to tell someone to avoid a dark chocolate, you know, with an advisory labeling for milk if they have a severe milk allergy when the contamination rate is so high compared to somebody who's allergic to egg where the contamination rates were, were very low. Um, even things come into play like, where is the patient? Are they traveling? Mm-hmm. You know, are they in the woods? Do they have access to medical care if, you know, there were to be an allergic reaction? Um, you know, nowadays, we also have to factor in things like, is the patient tolerating some amount of the allergen? So, for example, if someone's tolerating baked milk or baked egg, but is allergic to raw milk or, or cooked egg, you know, I'd be less inclined to tell them to avoid a product with advisory labeling. Um, you know, they're already ingesting some amount of the allergen. They're very unlikely to be that small group that would react to a trace contaminant. Um, and certainly patients on oral immunotherapy who are ingesting a small amount of an allergen on a daily basis, you know, should be able to tolerate products with, with advisory labeling. Um, mm-hmm. So. All of these factors come into play, but, you know, I think most importantly, you have to talk to the patient about what kind of risk they're willing to take um, and, and how much benefit there is to a particular product. You know, the last thing I would say is, is there a good alternative to the product with an advisory labeling? You know, if there's two chocolate chip cookies next to each other and they look equally good and one says that it may contain peanut and one of them doesn't, well, sure, why not choose the one that doesn't have an advisory label that, that you know, the cookie may contain peanut? Um, so, so all of those factors come into play, but I do think this is one of those times, you know, where shared decision-making uh, is going to be important. You know, I do think these days we, we can be frustrated by shared decision-making. You know, patients come in saying, I want this thing that I read on the Internet, um, and, and, you know, sometimes I wish I could just make decisions myself without it being a discussion. But this is really one of those times that, that shared decision making between uh, an allergist immunologist and a, a patient is, is really, really important. Well, Dr. K- Dr. Katan, I really appreciate you taking the time to dive into that. And uh, it's great. I think you, for our listeners, I, you know, I truly appreciate the evidence based nuanced discussion you just offered us. I mean, you encapsulated like kind of 10 years of outdated information and presented sort of the way we should be approaching things in this day and age. Uh, and I know there's a lot of fear surrounding this topic. So I hope that people are at least put at ease and at least appreciate that there are avenues to discuss and there are, you know, different ways that people can proceed and what works for one person may not work for another. And, and I think that's an important part of this as well. What do we know about, like, so quality of life for individuals in regards to precautionary labels? Does this impact them in any way? Oh, definitely. You know, stress, anxiety associated with with managing a food allergy has certainly been shown to affect quality of life in our patients. You know, the the direct impact of of these precautionary labels, these advisory labels, is not well studied. Um, You know, there was one study from from the U.K. back in 2010 Um, which did show that maternal and child quality of life scores were higher if study participants reported eating foods that said may contain um, an allergen compared to those who were avoiding those foods. Um, Choosing to avoid products with advisory labeling can result in reduced food choices for consumers with food allergies. That can result in higher food costs. It could result in nutritional risks. Um, you know, in patients who consumed foods with advisory labels, reasons included costs. It included insufficient time to shop for alternative products um, and even an inability to find enough other options when there are so many products with advisory labeling these days. Mm. Are there examples of other countries that have adopted a more standardized and meaningful approach towards how they label um, their products in regards to food allergens? Yeah, there there are certain countries that have adopted more standardized approaches to precautionary allergen labeling. Um, you know, when it comes to countries listing when when an allergen is an intended ingredient, I think the variability is more which allergens are included. Um, mm-hmm. 
you know, and that can vary from country to country. But as far as the advisory labeling, many countries, such as Australia, Canada, the European Union, much like the U.S., precautionary allergen labeling is voluntary. Um, there are a couple of countries, such as Japan and Switzerland, um, where these labels are only used when allergen levels cross designated allergen thresholds. Um, so I think it might be a little bit easier for consumers in those countries to know um, if there's a legitimate risk to a product um, with an advisory labeling. Here's a loaded question for you. And again, feel free not to answer it, but why on earth can't we do a better job in the United States? It's <laughs> um, a, a very good question, and I'm going to try not to get political on it. Uh, <laughs> you know, First of all, I'm not sure that we can't do the same thing here in the United States. I think it would be difficult, um, but I'm hopeful that that we would be able to, to take a more um, evidence-based or, or threshold-based um, approach to advisory labeling. Um, you know, I think that big companies in this country might, or even small companies, might argue that increased testing for, let's say, allergen contamination would be costly, and that cost would lead to higher food prices for consumers, and, and cons consumers who are already facing inflation don't want to pay higher prices. You know, they might also argue in this country that putting these labels on, even if the risk is extremely small, may help them avoid costly litigation if someone does have a reaction to a product that did contain a trace allergen um, that was not intended as an ingredient. Um, you know, there, there's very little that our government leaders seem to agree on these days, but hopefully one day they can come together and pass legislation that could better regulate the wording on these labels um, that manufacturers are using when they are using, you know, precautionary statements. Dr. Catan, you just earned my vote. So let me know when you're running for public office, and uh, I'll, I'll help however I can with your campaign. I think there's too many kids with food allergies these days to, to, to leave them hanging. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as we transition here and, and um, wrap up our, our great conversation, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the work group uh, that we mentioned in the beginning that you're leading within the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology? What was the, uh, the impetus to start this, and what are the goals? Well, I'll start with the, the impetus to starting this, and I, and I think that it stemmed from, in, in part, my own frustration with the labeling and the lack of guidance on how patients should approach these labels. You know, it's difficult to truly assess the, the risk for every individual patient, and I wish I could hand a, a flyer from the Quad AI, you know, a, a one-page statement to patients that, that tells them what to do with these advisory statements, but obviously that doesn't exist. Um, I think it really struck me that we needed improvements in our advisory labeling when I led a seminar at the Quad AI uh, annual meeting a couple years ago with Catherine Agnon and Agnostu, sorry if I butchered that, um, on how to advise patients on advisory labeling. And this room was filled with 25 allergists and dietitians who universally expressed their frustration and confusion with advisory labeling. You know, there were some people who said they tell all of their patients to avoid every product with an advisory label. And there were some patients who told all of their patients to totally ignore all the advisory labeling. And I realized that those two very different pieces of advice were not coming from different interpretations of, of data and guidance, but just the, the lack of data and the lack of guidance that's out there. So, you know, one of our first goals was to get the limited information that is available on food allergy advisory, advisory labeling out there to allergists and to patients um, through podcasts like this and seminars at our conferences and, and writing review papers. Um, we hope to administer a survey to allergists to gather more information on how they interpret products with advisory labeling and how they advise their patients about these products. You know, once we know how our colleagues are interpreting these labels, we could identify where the biggest gaps are and hopefully target meaningful improvements in the labeling. You know, ultimately, and this is more off in the distance, but, but I think our goals are to help create a more standard system of advisory labeling in this country and to write up guidelines for practitioners and patients on how to approach products with advisory uh, allergen labels. 
I think that's so fantastic and a prime example of how members such as yourself and just medical professionals, you you know, you have a an interest in doing more and getting involved and in how the the organization you know, the larger organization can support you in that. If people are interested in joining the work group, is this something that people can apply to join or tell us a little bit more about that? So so this work group exists under the, the larger Adverse Reactions to Foods Committee of the Quad AI. So I think the, the easiest first step if people want to get involved uh, more in, in food allergy um, advice for patients and, and different work groups is to first join the Adverse Reactions to Foods Committee of the Quad AI. Um, once joining that group, um, you know, practitioners can choose different work groups, um, and there's a wide variety of work groups uh, addressing a, a large number of topics, things like eating in restaurants, um, advisory labeling, um, you know, how to... Um, treat allergic reactions, um, mm -hmm. you know. So, so there are a large variety of work groups um, within the Adverse Reactions to Foods Committee, but, but joining that committee would be the first step. Okay, excellent. This is clearly a very confusing topic. Uh, that's, that's why I'm so glad that um, we have you on as a guest to discuss this. And it's filled with extreme variation in regards to the advice that's offered from advocacy organizations as well as individual medical professionals. What are some of the outdated messages that you would like to see forward from regarding precautionary labeling? You know, I think we've really covered most of the outdated messages, you know, throughout this discussion. Um, but to, to bring up some of the key points again, I think it's important to remember that while advisory labeling may be worded in different ways, the risk is similar among the different products. Um, and it's also too important to remember that precautionary labeling in the U.S. and Canada is unregulated. It's not based on any strict testing of products uh, looking for contamination with an allergen. Uh, so, you know, really the the risk is highly variable, and and you know patients really need to decide on how they're going to approach these labels with their allergist. There's really no hard rules when it comes to advisory labeling. No, I think that's great. Uh, all right. If I can have you address, you know, we'll have you choose one misconception if you can, or you, we can give you a couple if you'd like, just surrounding food allergy risk or reactions, because we know there's a lot of just outdated and correct information surrounding that that I think causes a lot of fear among those living with food allergy. Uh, what would you like to address and why is it important to debunk it? This is actually a very easy question for me to answer, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's actually unrelated to advisory labeling or contained statements. You know, I think the most harmful misconception around food allergy and, and food allergic reactions is clearly the, the thought that using an epinephrine auto-injector is somehow dangerous, um, you know, and that when we use an auto-injector, we have to go to the emergency room because we need to be monitored for the potential harmful effects of epinephrine. You know, epinephrine is an extremely safe and life-saving medicine and we should have no hesitation to use it during a severe allergic reaction. You know, I always tell my patients it's better to use the epinephrine when you don't need it than to not use it when you need it, if they're ever not sure about whether or not to use their epinephrine during an allergic reaction. You know, the reason we tell our patients to go to the ER after using their epinephrine is because of the severity of the reaction, not because of the medicine. You know, and that, that risk of a biphasic reaction after the epinephrine has worn off. So. You know, I think epinephrine is underutilized, it is life-saving, and it is extremely safe, and I hope that everybody knows that, and I think that's the most important, you know, thing to, to get out there to our patients. Um, don't fear your epinephrine. Your passion is, is infectious and is quite evident, and you deliver very clear, concise evidence-based pieces of information. Can I, after we're done here, just have you record some messages for me and I can just play them on an endless loop at our, at our food allergy <laughs> center? Would, would you be open to that? Absolutely. And, you know, I think, <laughs> I think part of my passion comes from, you know, living for, for 44 years now with, you know, a, a brother with food allergies. And I've seen how these, you know, things can uh, affect people and how food allergy can affect people, how, how advisory labeling can affect people. And, and it is a passion. Um, so, you know, not only for my patients, but, but for my family.
Oh, well, on behalf of all of our listeners, and you know, we really appreciate all that you're doing. And Dr. Katan, we, we covered a lot of great information on a very nuanced topic. It's really changed a lot in recent years, and I hope that our listeners you give them you know new food for thought, pun intended, uh, and in regards to you know how we can understand the the real risk associated with this versus perceived risk, and and how we counsel patients. Is there anything that we forgot to discuss, or that you'd like to add? I, I think we've we've covered all the important topics. You know, I, 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 if our our listeners have made it to the end of of this podcast, I'm impressed. I, I know I I tend to. Uh, to ramble sometimes, um, but but I also I mean I want to thank you, um, you know not only for for this podcast but all the podcasts you do I think they're exceptional, you know I think this is an important topic and I'm I'm really glad that you're covering it today. Um, I also want to thank you for mentoring me as as our listeners don't know you know you were one of my my attendings when I was a resident in Pittsburgh who helped me decide to go into allergy immunology as a profession, um, and and. One more thing, I, I would like to thank, you know, there's three people at, at Mount Sinai who have really helped me, um, you know, approach advisory labeling and, and, and contain statements and, and educated me on those topics. And, you know, one is Scott Sisher, who's done an immense amount of research in the field, but, but our two dietitians, um, Marion Groach and, and Allison Scheibel, um, who have published on the topic and, and helped me cover this topic, I, I really, really appreciate their help. Oh, well, Jake, it's been a pleasure, and uh, thank you again for taking the time to be with us today. This is really a very insightful conversation. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode. Please visit www.aaai.org for show notes and any pertinent links from today's conversation. If you like the show, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, so you can receive new episodes in the future. Thank you again for listening. 